much. I have to say, five panelists and two members of Congress in less than 45 minutes. That <laughs> must be a record. So we've all stayed on time. We have some time to open things up to questions. Um, I should mention there are some members of the press in the room. We would like for the conversation to be as open as you would like that to be as well. So feel free. If you have any questions, this group of panelists are really outstanding experts on this issue. I think I rely on all of them seems like daily as of late, so I would encourage you to direct any questions to them. I have a question for Patrick. Uh, there was a, one of the panel a few weeks ago over at Heritage, and one of the guys who was speaking in favor of metadata collection and, and doing a clean re off on 215 was taking an argument, not just Smith versus Washington, um, but he was also saying that there wasn't a reasonable expectation of privacy regarding metadata in itself. And he made the comparison of saying that uh, well, when you walk out in the street, you don't hide your face, you expect that everyone should see you, so that for when you're carrying a cell phone around and sending digital transmissions to towers and such, that was essentially the same thing. Um, could you explain why, in your opinion, you think that's incorrect? Yeah, um, it's probably good that I was in the room when he said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my, my friend Sean, is the constitutional lawyer and expert here, and I'll certainly defer to him in a moment. But I, I would just direct that gentleman, uh, and everybody else for that matter, to the opinion that Judge Richard Leon of the U.S. District Court issued in December 2013 when he declared the metadata program unconstitutional. Uh, that's the suit that Larry Clayman bought. Don't let the Larry Clayman thing turn you off. Um, it's a valid suit. There are actually two other suits that are in front of uh, appeals courts right now on this very topic basically making the same point. And, and Judge Leon was just magnificent in kind of, I, I commend you to look at the opinion, and if you need uh, links to that or whatever, my business cards are up here. My colleagues, I think, have, they've got their contact available, uh, data available for you. We can get you anything you basically need, but briefly, uh, Judge Leon kind of went through exactly what metadata tells you, and I can direct you to some other folks who can get into this in, in even more detail than I can. There's some real genuine tech experts that are sitting in the room. But the bottom line is, when, when you're talking about metadata, you're talking about the ability to basically discover almost everything about a human being, who they talk to, who they interact with on the internet, the websites they go to. Um, I'm a gun owner, um, somewhat unusual for a Democrat, but um, uh, when I talk to my friends uh, in, in the gun rights community about this, I say, look, um, they know what shooting club you're part of. They know what range you go to if you bought ammunition online. Uh, and they know all of your friends who might be involved in that. That's what metadata does. It obliterates the entire idea of personal privacy if the government is allowed to collect all that data because it just simply tells you so much more about the individual and their associations. And that's really what I think the Pew poll is reflecting. Is, is folks get that. Everybody understands that. When people are no longer you know, utilizing certain search terms on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever because they're afraid the government is scooping this up and if they type in Al-Qaeda, suddenly they're going to be on a TSA watch list. And that's a possibility. I mean, that's not a far-fetched scenario. That's a real possibility. Um, then we've completely gone overboard. So that's why, just kind of from a, a basic context, I think, that the metadata argument matters. And I think Shaw might be able to shed even more light on Great, great answer, Patrick. And just to dig in on that, the, the, the reasonable expectation of privacy standard is applicable particularly to Fourth Amendment claims, but there's much more than that implicated here. Uh, for instance, the lawsuit in which the Electronic Frontier Foundation is representing us and 18 other organizational plaintiffs on whom the NSA spied is proving by the Verizon 215 order, the first among the Snowden leagues, uh, that case raises First Amendment claims. Under the right of association in particular, there's a line of cases dating back to the civil rights era when southern states were seeking the membership lists, particularly of the NAACP. And the Supreme Court held firm and ruled in those cases, rightly so, that membership organizations have a right to privacy as to who is in them to avoid state repression, essentially. The NSA dragnet flips that entire line of cases over without any meaningful consideration of the implications, right? When we talk about a rush debate or lies under oath, what we're talking about here is the subversion of legal standards, not just surrounding the Fourth Amendment, but the First Amendment too. When we look at the creation of uh, mass uh, metadata collection and its analysis over time, what we actually are witnessing is the creation of a whole new thing that has not existed before. 
the likes of which the founders could not possibly have anticipated. I mean, we're talking about basically a political suppression machine, right? That's what, that's what secret, unaccountable mass surveillance could become. And we've seen it before in other countries, namely countries that we tilted against very, again, rightly so. Uh, and it's disturbing to see many of the abuses that happened behind the, cold, the Iron Curtain under the Cold War find themselves being replicated in the, you know, we won the Cold War, didn't we? Right? Why are we dealing with this here in the United States? This is what we railed against for generations. Uh, uh, I just want to say two other things on this. The, every federal court ever to reach the merits of a claim challenging mass surveillance has found it to be unconstitutional. The, uh, Patrick referenced Judge Leon's case. You can go as far back as 2006. Uh, judge of Detroit, Anna Diggs Taylor, was the first of the judges to find this unconstitutional. In every single one of those cases, has been overturned on appeal by courts that have found not that mass surveillance is constitutional, but rather that the plaintiffs didn't have a right to challenge it. Think about that for a second. You know, the courts have basically been written out of the equation due to executive secrecy. The most recent case to challenge the NSA's mass surveillance program to go up to the Supreme Court was Clapper versus Amnesty International. It was uh, spring of 2013, just a few weeks, quite frankly, before the Snowden leaks. And what did the court find in that case? That because the plaintiffs in that case, who included lawyers and journalists who spoke with and met with the families of Guantanamo detainees, exactly who, quite frankly, we would probably want the government to be watching, right? Those people did not have standing, according to the Supreme Court, because they could not prove through documents that they were being monitored by the U.S. government. And of course, what we all found out a few weeks later is that we are all being monitored by the U.S. government, uh, including your offices and your bosses. Uh, and I do just want to bring it back to the self protection, I, uh, the self, the protection of your own institutional prerogatives that I referenced before. Um, the last thing I just want to say on your piece here, uh, and I, I can't recall who on the panel referenced this earlier, but we, there's another lens through which to think about this and the legal basis, which references not the rights at stake, but the accountability of agencies that have been rewarded for failure and lies with increasing powers and budgets. And this bill presents an opportunity for your offices to reclaim who runs Washington. And it shouldn't be unaccountable executive agencies that, that lie to the people at every opportunity. Um, the, the SSRA would essentially shift the burden of proof to force the agencies to justify the expansion of their powers over the last 15 years. And that's fully appropriate, long overdue, I dare say. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Go for it. So, in the, how would anybody in the panel respond to uh, assertions by the intelligence community or President Obama that between FISC and the intelligence committees that there is adequate oversight? I'm, I'm happy to jump on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, I mean, how is there adequate <laughs> oversight? Um, we, we know that. Uh, there's a pattern of misleading Congress uh, when they are uh, when when NSA officials testify. Um, there seems to be a pattern. Uh, one of the other panelists can correct me if I'm exaggerating here, but of saying we need these to keep you safe. And when, whenever we're asked, we ask, "Well, give us a, give us an example." That's classified. I mean, if if Snowden's leaks had actually damaged national security or had led to a, a terrorist attack that could have been prevented not being prevented? Does anyone here seriously believe that that information wouldn't have leaked onto the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? Anyone? No, I mean, it's, it's the, the oversight that's done is a, uh, is a is a is a charade. Um, this Sunday is, is WrestleMania. There's more real. There's going to be more <laughs> reality in WrestleMania than there is going to be at at any testimony by an NSA official to an oversight uh, official in Congress. Um, our street uh, led a led a coalition last December looking at intelligence committee reforms, and uh, it's hard to call it democratizing intelligence committee reforms, but actually making information accessible to rank and file members of Congress and uh, making it available to their to a staff, uh, giving them clearance. That's, that, is, that would actually help us. That would make me feel a little better 
if I knew that a certain representative from Wisconsin or a certain representative from Kentucky or a certain representative from Michigan had the ability to actually see everything that the Intelligence Committee is seeing. Um, at this point, they aren't. They, they don't have that ability. As we said earlier, there's no whistleblower protection for, uh, rep uh, for, for an Edward Snowden or, or someone else to actually like, um, contact the member of Congress and talk about that. The same thing is rep you know, representatives are regularly voting on things because their caucus or the Intelligence Committee told them to do that. And I think that's a really major concern for, for, for all of us, um, is that you have this really, you almost have two Congresses you, uh, on this issue. You have two governments on, on this issue. And I, I would point you in a really good conversation that was had at CPAC, believe it or not, a good conversation on surveillance reform was had at CPAC between James Clapper and, um, and, and Judge Napolitano. Uh, they actually had a really interesting dialogue back and forth discussing the questions about surveillance state versus uh, a libertarian liberty perspectives. And it was really neat to see. I disagreed with you know, James Clapper on a lot of things there, but it was a very open dialogue that I think should be encouraged more because over the past couple of years, they've been forced to actually answer these questions. And I think an individual like Judge Napolitano or some other media types could be able to bring that conversation up. I'm waiting for the Greenwald Clapper conversations yeah. to come out on DVD, but we'll, we'll wait till then. I, I think what's extremely damning is to just kind of look at the public record. When my boss um, was working at Pier, um, on December the 9th, 2005, he paid a visit to Gerald Alexander, NSA, and he asked him one very simple question during the dog and pony tour. Are you spying on Americans? And Gerald Alexander was emphatic, no, Congressman Cole, we are not doing that, we would never do that. Seven days later, Jim Risen and the New York Times run the first story on the Stellar Loon program. One of my one of my permanent memories from my time working up here was the congressman standing over my shoulder dictating the most blistering letter that he had written in his life to a government official. And he called out Alexander by name and directly for lying to his face about the very existence of these programs. So it really kind of goes to what Nathan is talking about. I mean, before these Patriot Act votes occurred in 2011, um, the Hipsy had information that should have been in the hands of every member of this body in order to make an informed decision, and they didn't supply it. Uh, and Nathan's former boss was very vocal about that, great, greatly to his credit, uh, you know, when that finally surfaced. And, and for me, that really kind of gets to the heart of the corruption of the process, right? If your bosses are asked to vote on things on the floor when they haven't had time to read a bill, that's bad enough. But when people in, in the leadership are making decisions to, for whatever reason, to not share critical information with your bosses about votes having to do with the constitutional liberties of, of your constituents, folks, that's a big problem. And, and that's got to come to an end. And that's one of the things that this bill ultimately, I think, would help to address going forward. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve everything. But as I think everybody up here on this panel would, would agree, we need to raise the bar on what constitutes reform, and we need to be loud uh, about it going forward. If I can, just one thought on the question of oversight and the adequacy of historical oversight. I'm going to take you back a few years to just lay the, the context again for the Intelligence Committees, how they came to be, how they've been circumvented, and then connected to the current moment. The reason we have Intelligence Committees in the House and Senate is because in the 1970s, two members of Congress convened new committees to investigate what they learned about because a bunch of anti-war activists broke into an FBI office outside Philadelphia. And what they discovered was what the U.S. Senate in 1976, this is a quote from Book 3 of the Church Committee, described as a, quote, sophisticated vigilante operation aimed squarely at suppressing the legitimate exercise of First Amendment rights of speech and association. That was the finding of the U.S. Senate the first time anybody decided to look very closely at our nation's secret uh, intelligence activities. The creation of the intel committees, the passage of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which the agencies circumvented uh, in the early years after 9-11. These were not random incidents. These were the responses to demonstrated, proven, documented lies, corruption, mass assaults on the rights of the American people. That's the context in which you find yourselves now, right? These are recidivist agencies with a pattern over generations. And so your bosses, are standing in a line of people who have held their offices before, who have tried to address these issues. And we are back again with new technology waging some, some of the very same struggles. Um, when called before uh, congressional oversight committees, executive officials from administrations from both parties have controlled access to the facts, right? We talked about that. 
members of Congress being denied access to just knowing what the agencies are doing. They've been denied access to expertise, even on the Intelligence Committee. The chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, when he was first told about what was then called the Terrorist Surveillance Program, the early iteration of what became the NSA Dragnet, he wrote a letter by hand and put it in a drawer saying, I've been told about this program, but they wouldn't let me have lawyers, they wouldn't let me have technologists, and that, that was his, you know, uh, document to share when then the entire sort of thing became public, you know, many years later. Uh, this is the context though, right? I'm, I'm just trying to lay this out for you so you recognize that you know, this, isn't, this isn't isolated. This is not the first time this has happened. It's not the first time that agencies have tried to lie to Congress to shoehorn illegal and unconstitutional powers uh, despite constitutional limits. Last thing I'll just say, there's a book that you might check out that I think is informative with respect to the underlying issues at stake here by Michael Glennon, former Senate staffer, now teaching at Tufts University, called Double, Double Government. And the essence of his thesis is that you are being circumvented by executive agencies that are seizing control over the national security apparatus and duping members of Congress at every opportunity and, and, and into essentially allowing the executive to run amok. And in that context, I would encourage you to read it. It's a quick read, and it, it might be very illuminating with respect not only to this particular bill, but a host of other issues uh, that folks have rightly brought up as connected. It's, it's also, it's not just allowing an executive to run amok above a Congress. It's allow, it's the agencies run without even supervision of the president. Which, I mean, it's, it's, which is bad enough, but then when they're ignoring Congress, and I, I would just remind you all, um, going back to what the founders intended, there's a reason why the, the, why the legislative branch is Article One. They didn't just um, pick numbers out of a hat and decide, you know, we picked Congress first, so that's Article One. President second, that's Article Two. It's because Congress is supposed to be the most important branch. It's supposed to be first among equals in our uh, divided system of government. You're not supposed to be subservient to the executive branch. One, one of the worst things I saw in my 15 years with Dr. Paul was there was a hearing after the uh, 2005 revelations that I was at with Congressman Paul, and the chairman of the committee actually apologized to the NSA bureaucrat who was testifying for um, having to take up his valuable time by coming up to the Hill to testify to the people's elected representatives. How awful the Congress would infringe on uh, the time of, of uh, and, and that's an attitude that really needs to change. And this legislation is a good step towards it, to reasserting the idea that Congress actually is in charge of the security and the surveillance state apparatus, not, and they act on behalf of the people and to protect the people's liberties, not the other way around. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. If you have any other questions, and these guys might be able to stick around for a few, and um, feel free to draw upon their wisdom. Otherwise, again, I'm Alicia in Mr. Pocan's office. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or if your bosses are interested in co-sponsoring the bill. Thanks, and have a good day.